up to about 1920, going right back from about 1800. The, uh, all the writing in the field was done by practitioners. There was no such a thing as an academic teaching supply management anywhere. Uh, one of the very early ones to in fact appear was Howard Lewis at the Harvard Business School, who made a speech to the National Association of Purchasing Agents, as it was called, at the annual conference in the 1920s. And as the participants walked out, they were heard to mutter, he was talking general management instead of purchasing, <laughs> uh, which is exactly the direction that we've been taking, as you all know, with slow steps over a number of years. Uh, uh, but the very first book on purchasing written by an academic did not appear till 1933, which was written by the same Howard Lewis we're talking about. Before that, every single text was written by a practitioner. And that notion that we talk about these days of value, the idea that, uh, in fact, somebody around 1918 came out with a statement that a good salesman can be good for a company, a bad salesman will not be so good for a company, a good purchaser is essential for a company, a bad purchaser can ruin the company, arguing that uh, the impact of poor procurement practices uh, were far more severe than poor marketing practices or poor sales practices. It's not just price that determines whether something is a good buy or not. It uh, was well established by the 1920s and there was a whole series of books that came out arguing that kind of thing. The, uh, the Purchasing Managers Index that the, uh, um, was started by the American Association at that point actually was started in Chicago and the, American, uh, the National Association took it over. So that's been around since the 1920s. Originally, it was strictly intended for purchasing people only because in the days before computers and information sharing, it was largely a, a way of letting purchasers know what is happening with certain commodities, what is happening in the market, and this kind of thing. More and more associations became very active here in the States in terms of their own educational programs. Uh, interesting enough, in Canada, we started our national educational program back in 1963. Uh, in the States was a little bit later in terms of their designation, but I think both of these moves did a lot for tying practitioners and academics together uh, and advanced the profession along. I, I think we can certainly credit our practitioner CPOs from the earlier decades with the vision they have for the organization. But if we compare the qualifications of these individuals at this point of time, and we did a study on, you know, what is the background of people who are heading up supply in large organizations, for example. If I were to show you a sample of 100 people and ask you who's, which of these people is in charge of a major function in an organization like marketing, CPO, uh, whatever, whatever, you'd see the nice, for me, the very nice thing to do is that these people, our supply people are indistinguishable from all the other major areas of business in terms of their qualifications to be there. And therefore, our targets to become CEOs, our, you know, our, our excellent general managers and, and are doing exciting things. In the 50s, uh, was a lot of excitement about the field already uh, at, at, at Harvard, uh, Howard Lewis, retired and my, my mentor, Bill England, took over down there uh, on the mantra again that, you know, suppliers are absolutely critical to the performance of the organization and that we've got to find effective ways of connecting suppliers to, and the supply chain to, uh, to the goals and objectives of the organization. Um, and as it is for every function, okay, I don't want to single us out along those kind of lines. Uh, that, that that was a struggle for marketing just like it was for finance and you know we fit in, in that notion of how can we contribute effectively.